Hello, BookTube. I've got a little mail for you today on a very changeable Wednesday. It was pouring rain this morning, first thing when the sun came up. Then that went away, and it became very mild and very sunny, almost warm. Uh, and now it's raining again. So it's just a, a very unsettled day. Not, not at all the type of day that you want to go out and do errands or anything like that. I took the bean out a few times. Uh, but it's always a little nerve-wracking to take her out on a day when rain could crop up at any minute, because she doesn't view it as just getting wet. She hates the rain. <laughs> hates it more epically than any dog I've ever had has hated the rain. I've had plenty of dogs that didn't like it. And one or two, I've had one or two boys who loved it. I've had one or two boys where it, the worst possible day in the world, dark black skies at two in the afternoon, slanting cold rain and wind. That was their idea of perfect weather, to go out hiking in the woods, to go out climbing in the uphill meadows and whatnot. And uh, I liked it too. Once you get used to it, once you get used to hiking around in Donegal weather, you really enjoy it. I, it's been a long time since I had a dog that was like that. All my dogs now are confirmed indoor dogs, and Frida is the most of them all. So it was a little nerve-wracking, but when, it, when the sun was bright and high in the afternoon, it was it was perfectly fine. We had a wonderful encounter with two encounters with dogs on one of our walks this afternoon. One was terrible. One was a terrible encounter, not with the dog, but with the owner. Uh, but the other one was wonderful. I was, I, that was a guy walking in English terrier, the kind that have the, just a, a straight featureless conical snout. They don't have a, an indentation for their nose. They don't have eyebrows. They're just a, a, a shark like nose of a face. Uh, and Frida screamed at him, of course. And, the owner took his cue from me. I was clearly not warding off a vicious dog. Most owners take their cue from me. They see that I'm not acting that way, that I'm smiling and laughing. So they understand that Frida's all talk, that she's not going to hurt their dog. And maybe they allow... I, I take my cues from them. I, if they're okay with her coming closer, then I bring her closer because nothing's going to happen. No matter what it sounds like. It sounds like the end of the world. So I understand when owners don't want us to get any closer, but it's not going to be the end of the world. And I, of course, want to meet the dog. <laughs> I want to meet the other dog. And that bull terrier was adorable. <laughs> he was adorable. He got right away. It took him about a second to realize that he can just ignore Frida. She's just going to sniff him. She's not going to do anything to him. And so he and I got to cuddle, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we have two packages here. Uh, no actual mailman mail. No uh, junk mail, no bills, <laughs> and no magazines that I can see. I, I haven't sent anybody to check in quite some time. We have two packages here, one envelope and one box. And I think I know what the box is. Uh, so let's let's do the envelope first. The envelope is just from a publisher. Uh, so let's see what we have here. Uh, this it comes out in July. This is by Chris Nashawati. Uh and it is called The Future Was Now, Mad Men, Mavericks, and the Epic Sci-Fi Summer of 1982. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is a, I'm assuming this is about movies, because you've got the, the saucer here, the, the uh, extraterrestrial saucer, is old film. It, those are film sprockets. So I'm assuming that's what that means, which means that when the cover describes him as the author of Caddyshack, he might actually be the author of Caddyshack. We'll find out. I bet this is about science fiction movies in 1982. Uh, so I don't have a sheet for it. Let's just let's just read uh, the back here. From acclaimed entertainment journalist and author of Caddyshack comes the rollicking... See? I'm not the only one who uses that word. The rollicking history of 1980s cinema. How eight legendary sci-fi films changed Hollywood forever. <laughs> I wonder if Chromaticus Books re would review this for me. I wonder if he would. I'll ask him. Uh, in the summer of 1982, oh, when all the world made sense. In the summer of 1982. That was 40 years ago. That's just not possible. Uh, eight science fiction films were released within eight weeks of one another. Wait till you hear this rundown. I haven't seen it, but I can guess what it is. It doesn't seem possible. E.T., Tron, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, Conan the Barbarian, Blade Runner, Poltergeist, The Thing, and Mad Max The Road Warrior. All within one summer. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, these movies changed the careers of some of Hollywood's now biggest names, altering the art of movie making to this day. In this book, the author recounts the riotous genesis of these films. I'm assuming genesis is not a pun on Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. Uh, featuring an all-star cast of Hollywood luminaries and gadflies alike. Steven Spielberg, at the height of his powers, conceives E.T. as an unlikely family tale and quietly takes over the troubled production of Poltergeist, a horror film he'd been neutering for years. Ridley Scott, fresh from the success of Alien, tries his hand at an odd Philip K. Dick story that becomes Blade Runner, a box office failure that turned cult classic. Similar stories arise from films like Tron, Conan the Barbarian, and The Thing. Taken as a whole, these films show a precarious turning point in Hollywood history when baffled film executives finally began to understand the potential of high-concept films with a rabid fan base, merchandising potential, and endless possible sequels. So these authors claiming that not only were the, was that an incredible string of movies in a small amount of time, but that it changed the way Hollywood thinks about movies. Interesting. Uh, expertly researched, energetically told, and written with an unabashed love for the cinema, this book is a chronicle of how the revolution sparked in a galaxy far, far away finally took root and changed Hollywood forever. So the author is a writer, editor, and former Entertainment Weekly film critic. He's the author of Caddyshack. Oh no, The Making of a Hollywood Cinderella Story. Okay, so he wrote a book called Caddyshack. Uh, and his work has appeared in Esquire, Sports Illustrated, and Vanity Fair. And, of course, he lives in L.A. So, uh, the sci-fi movies of 1982. <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> but in this case, I think I ought to ask Grammaticus Books if, if, uh, if he might like to read and review this. I mean, he does review books. He does a competent job of it. And he's never, in many important ways, he's never left 1982. So he's in the perfect position to do it. I will do it myself. Because I have a lot to say about a lot of those movies, and I'm sure I will learn a lot here, but I'm going to ask him and see. Uh, then we have the box, and the box has a, a an old-timey, you know, ye old address on it, so I'm assuming this is from a person. And if it's from a person and it's uh, predictable, then I know what it is. Uh, I think there's only one package in transit to me that is not a, a defiance of rule number one. Those of you who are new to this channel, rule number one is don't just up and send me a book. Oh, it stopped raining again. The sun's out. Uh, don't just up and send me a book. Don't go to your local library book sale or whatever and see David McCullough's Truman and think, oh, Steve likes biographies and just mail it to me. That would be a complete waste of your time and money and a complete waste of my mind and my time too. I live, eat, and breathe books. So the chances that you will just blindly stumble across something that I will not have and actually want are almost nil. But if you find something that you think I might be interested in, feel free to send me a picture. My email is on every video. And let me know. And if I want it, I will squeal. <laughs> I will squeal when I want it. But I think that's what happened here. I think, uh, let's see what's, what's in all this, all this package we've got here. Hi, baby. <laughs> that woke you up pretty quick, didn't it? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, the prime hunting ground for uh, this kind of thing, for a managing of uh, of rule number one, is a place called Ollie's. <laughs> Which, uh, some of you have an Ollie's nearby. They are a chain of super discount remainder items of all kinds, not just books. I had never heard of Ollie's, and then I went to uh, the one near the Richardson family up in Vermont, and it was astonishing. The kid that I talked to there said that the employees have no idea what's coming off the truck every day. Uh, they have no idea what the emphasis will be. Will it? Will the bulk of this latest shipment be uh, winter jackets? Uh, I don't know, CDs? A particular kind of snack food. It's everything. You get you get you can get anything that you want at Ollie's, anything that you're looking for, and at a dirt cheap price. And I thought that was that was fascinating. Anyway, that'll be old hat to a lot of you because a lot of you are familiar with uh, places like Walmart or Kmart. I'm not familiar with them because you need a car to get to those places. I don't have a car. Wouldn't know how to work one anyway if I had one. So I, I don't 
I don't ever go to those places, so they always astonish me when I do go. You can get anything at Ollie's. All the snack food that you want, dried freeze food, furniture, uh, plumbing and supply equipment, and books. Ollie's has a very active book turnover. Uh, and one of you uh, saw this at an Ollie's and sent me a picture, and of course I didn't have it, so I squealed, and now I do have it. It's the Silmarillion. It's the the uh, this version of the Silmarillion with uh, Ted Naismith illustrations all throughout. Uh, so let's let's get a few of those while we while we chat. What is the first? I imagine the first one will be uh, Eru Iluvatar. Will that be right? Will it be? Will the first one be Eru Iluvatar singing the world into being? Oh no, it's just the sea. Look at that. Look at how lovely that is. How wonderful. Uh, what is what is the next one? If we get we move into the Valla Quenta, then we get the Quenta Silmarillion. Ah, there are the two trees, the two trees of Valinor. Uh, this is uh, the oh, look at that. One of the Valla creates the dwarves. He creates the race of dwarves uh, and gives them life and makes them sturdy and hardy. He crafts them out of rock, uh, but he isn't allowed to. The, he's not the all, the creator god who is the source of all life. He's not allowed to create life. He doesn't have any evil intention, uh, and I guess he sort of knows that in the song of the of the Valar, Eru Iluvatar plans on the elves awakening first, and I guess then humans, men, uh, with no mention of dwarfs. So the dwarfs have to go to sleep, and the the bit of lore here is that they did awaken first. Uh, but anyway, the, the picture that you saw there is that the, the, uh, Vala who makes the dwarfs, when he realizes that Eru Iluvatar is not pleased with him, takes up a hammer to destroy them. So the dwarfs' first ancestral cellular memory is of their god ready to kill them all, <laughs> ready to destroy them. Uh, but, uh, this has those illustrations all throughout. This is, uh, the legendarium, the, the thousands and thousands of years before the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. A lot of this stuff Tolkien had written out over decades. A lot of the stuff that ended up being in the book we think of as the Silmarillion was partially or not at all written by Tolkien. That It was reconstructed from either his scraps or his notes by Christopher Tolkien and Guy Gavriel Kay. So that it's it's a composite book, but it's terrific. It's It's not... We don't. We don't know. We will never know what this would have looked like if Tolkien had written it completely. If he'd written it and saw it through the, the presses and proofed it and whatnot and fin it, fiddled with it the way he he tended to do. He didn't do that. Uh, but still, uh, Christopher Tolkien made a whole career out of uh, creating editorial versions and curated versions of his father's notes and works and fragments and whatnot. And I used to criticize him for that, but I don't anymore. What a what an undertaking! What a gift to Tolkien fans for him to do that, uh, and who better to do it than him? So no, I would much rather. I'm glad of it, but I think the Silmarillion stands alone. Uh, uh, it stands uh, orders of magnitude above the rest of the stuff that Christopher Tolkien and others put together, in terms of being so much Tolkien uh, that it it really feels like you're reading the Bible of Tolkien's work. <laughs> Uh, this will, oh, these, these illustrations are so lovely, goodness gracious, there is a battle going on. But look at the choices that the artist makes, right? You, the battle is not the first thing that you see. The, your eye sees right away that glowing gap between beautiful trees and a gorgeous wilderness, which underscores the blasphemy that the battle itself is. It, which is the I know what this which one this battle is and that's the whole point of what's being discussed there uh, the undertone of what's being discussed in that battle is how horrifying it is that this violence has seeped into is being manipulated into the world of elves and men uh, this is an uneven reading experience it has uh, very finished stories not not necessarily claiming finished by Tolkien could be by Christopher Tolkien there are very finished stories in here that are incredibly moving, just wonderful. And then there are less finished things and also things that aren't really narrative stories at all. Uh, 
that can baffle a reader who's going into this thinking, oh, well, I love The Hobbit. I love The Lord of the Rings. Uh, it's not enough just to love those things. You have to want to know their lore. Because this is not one singular story. So you have to want to know the lore, that, that the, the deep lore that underscores that world, even when it has no direct effect on it. Uh, if you do want to know that, oh my, is this a reading experience? We've done it many times on this channel, talked about it many times, done a read-along many times. And having this makes me wonder if we should do another read-along. How long has it been since we did a read-along of the Silmarillion? It's been a while, hasn't it? Probably a couple of years. Maybe so. Maybe as a way to, uh, to honor the sender. Uh, because this is very, very nice. <laughs> Maybe the way to do this is... Uh... Oh, oh, this is just lovely. Look at that. Look at that. Vast caverns, illuminated only by an unhealthy orange glow, and down deep in the focus of the story, Sauron, forging the One Ring. How incredible. Oh, my. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe to honor getting this thing, we should do a Silmarillion read-along. I'm certainly up for it. Uh, I will ponder on that. But that is the mail. So we have a great illustrated version of the Silmarillion. I have other editions of this probably within view uh, on, here in the background here. But uh, but I didn't, I didn't have this one, and it was dirt cheap at Ollie's, so I'm glad that I have it now. And also, the future was now. 1982 science fiction and fantasy movies. <laughs> what was in the air? What was causing these things to be made? And what are the stories behind each one of them? Fantastic. All right, so that, that is the mail. Uh, a very weird stereoscopic day. Sorry for the light. It's not consistent. It hasn't been all day. Uh, I think that's going to change in the rest of the week, so I'm willing to put up with it today. It's kind of, kind of neat, in a way, not to be able to expect you know, consistency from minute to minute. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll be back. <laughs> I've, I have a, a Silmarillion now to glom over and to ponder. A Silmarillion read-along? We haven't done one in a while. When is the last time that we did one? I'll have to check and see. Uh, but I think it, it wasn't this year, so certainly that's time enough <laughs> that has passed to do another one. But anyway, I'll wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.